This video is going to be about dual vectors, which surprisingly aren't covered that well in most books I've read on tensor calculus, which is kind of why this video took me a while to get to. The best explanation I found on dual vectors was weirdly enough in a book on general relativity. Also, my repeated long breaks to focus on residency training probably didn't help me release this video in a timely fashion, but better late than never, I guess. Now, the best way to think of a dual vector, and in fact define a dual vector, is as a function. You shouldn't think of it as an arrow between two points with a specific magnitude and direction like a regular vector. You should think of it as a function. Now, a dual vector d, also called a one-form or a covector, is a function that takes a vector v as the input and spits out a real number. Notice that I've denoted my dual vector d by underlining it, and my regular vector v by putting an arrow on top. In the next few videos, I'm going to use this notation to help distinguish between when I'm using a dual vector and when I'm using a regular vector. The underline is for a dual vector, the arrow on top is for a regular vector. The important condition for d to be a dual vector is that in addition to returning a real number, it has to be a linear function. So if I input the sum of two vectors u and v into d, the result must be equal to the sum of d evaluated on each of those two vectors individually, so d of u plus v equals d of u plus d of v. The other requirement for d to be a linear function is if I input a vector v that's scaled by a real number alpha, the output should be the same as alpha scaling the simple vector v being applied to the dual vector function. So this summation rule and the scaling rule also need to be satisfied for d to be a dual vector. Now, if we step outside the world of tensor analysis, there's plenty of more abstract examples of dual vectors. The first is a dual vector representing a function which operates on n by n matrices and spits out the sum of the diagonal elements of those matrices, also known as the trace of the matrix. You can show that this trace function is a dual vector because in the linear algebra sense, it operates on a vector. The set of n by n matrices represents a vector space, so an element A of that vector space is technically a vector in the linear algebra sense, but not in the tensor sense. Now, in addition to operating on the vector, it spits out a real number in the form of the trace of A. This operation is also linear because the trace of the sum of two matrices is the sum of their traces, and the trace of a matrix scaled by a real number alpha is alpha times the trace of that matrix A. So we can conclude that the trace function is a dual vector. Another abstract example, a function which operates on an nth degree real polynomial P sub n of x and returns the value of that polynomial at x equals 1. This function is also a dual vector because it operates on a polynomial, which is a vector element in the vector space representing real polynomials of nth degree or less. It returns a real number, obviously, and you can show that it also obeys the summation rule, since the function applied to the sum of two polynomials is equal to the function applied to each polynomial individually and then summed at the end. It also obeys the scaling rule of linear functions, so if I input 1 into my polynomial p sub n, then p sub n of 1 times alpha is the same as if I scale my polynomial by alpha and then apply the input of 1 to that scaled polynomial. So this function is another example of a dual vector in the more abstract algebraic sense. So now we've seen some abstract examples of dual vectors or one forms or covectors, whatever you want to call them. Let's return to our comfortable world of tensor analysis to describe the exact kind of function a dual vector represents in the specific context of tensor analysis. In the context of tensor analysis, a dual vector d is an operation on the contravariant vector v that returns the inner product of v and the vector d that corresponds to the dual vector d. Now this definition is consistent with what we want from a dual vector. It takes a vector, a contravariant vector, spits out the dot product, which is a real number, and it's also a linear function because you know from basic linear algebra that the dot product is a linear operator. Now you might still be somewhat confused. You might ask, what do you mean when you create a contravariant vector d corresponding to the dual vector d? What's the nature of d? What does it actually look like? Worry not, because for the rest of the video, I'm going to give you some intuition behind the dual vector d and what it really means in tensor algebra. Let's start with a simple example. Suppose my dual vector d is given by the components 1 and 1. By convention, you write the dual vector d in the form of a row vector, and you write a regular vector v in the form of a column vector. 
Let's take our dual vector d and operate it on some generic two-dimensional contravariant vector, which I'll give by the components x super 1 and x super 2. Remember that contravariant components are indexed by a superscript, so x super 2 doesn't mean x to the power 2, it just means x with the superscript index 2. If we do this operation, we would just get the product of the row vector 1, 1 to the column vector x super 1 and x super 2, which would turn out to be x super 1 plus x super 2, just with simple matrix multiplication. This means that the value of the function that d represents is equal to x super 1 plus x super 2. So if the value of my function is 0, then that means x super 2 must equal the negative of x super 1. If the value of my function is 1, that means x super 2 equals 1 minus x super 1, and so on. I could apply this logic to many different possible values of my function, 2, 3, and so on. Now when I plot this in my x super 1, x super 2 coordinate system, which I'll assume is a rectangular Cartesian coordinate system, I'll get different lines like this. Each of these lines, labeled in blue, represents a different value of my dual vector function. So this line represents the possible input vectors that'll give you a function value of 0, this line is for a function value of 1, and so on, negative 1, negative 2, positive 2, etc. I've labeled them from negative 5 to 5. So in the end, this graph of function values represents my dual vector. It's a function that gives you different values for different input vectors with the values corresponding to these lines that I've drawn. If you look closely, the dual vector also has a magnitude and direction. The magnitude represents how quickly it increases, so how far these lines of constant integer value are spread apart, and the direction represents the direction in which the function value increases, so in this case it would be in the northeast direction. But even though the dual vector has a magnitude and direction, it's a different kind of magnitude and direction compared to your regular arrow vector. Let's look at a quick input example. If I have an input vector u of 2 and 3, then when I apply my dual vector d to the input u, I get 5 as my answer. That's because if I draw the u on my graph, I can see that as I go from the start of the vector u to the end of the vector u, the value of the dual vector function increases from 0 to 5, and that's why I get 5 as my output. You can also verify this algebraically by taking the dot product of the corresponding column vector of d and u. Another example, if my input w is negative 1 and negative 2, then the dual vector applied to w gives negative 3 as the answer. That's because when I draw my w on this graph, the output of the dual vector decreases from 0 to negative 3 as I go from the start to the end of w. So in general, when a dual vector d is applied to an input vector v, what we get in the end is how much of the dual vector d we crossed as we went from the start of the vector v to the end of the vector v. And you can see this with the vectors w and u in the example we just did. Hopefully this explanation should provide you some intuition behind dual vectors. It might also give you some intuitive justification behind why the gradient is also a dual vector. Recall that if I have a function f of the coordinates x super 1 and x super 2, then the gradient of f tells me how fast f is increasing in the x super 1 direction and in the x super 2 direction using the partial derivative of f with respect to x super 1 and the partial derivative of f with respect to x super 2. Now you might remember from vector calculus that if I take the inner product of the gradient of f with the contravariant vector v, then that tells me how quickly f changes in the direction of the vector v. This is also known as the directional derivative. So the gradient vector is a dual vector. It can be thought of as a function which takes the input vector v and spits out a directional derivative. The directional derivative tells you how quickly the function changes as we go from one end of the input vector v to the other. These qualities of the gradient vector are very similar to the qualities of the generic dual vector d that I described up here. The dual vector also takes a contravariant input vector v, and when operated on v, it tells us how much the dual vector changed or increased as we went from the start of v to the end of v. So since the nature of the gradient vector and the dual vector are very, very similar, it's reasonable to conclude just based on intuition that the gradient vector is a dual vector. Now the reason I bring up the gradient vector is that in my previous video in this playlist on tensors, I showed how the gradient vector is a covariant vector, 
its components transform according to the covariant transformation law. And since the gradient vector is a dual vector, it's reasonable to extend that logic to any generic dual vector and say that instead of being described by contravariant components like a regular vector v, a dual vector d is described using the covariant vector components, which I'll label with the subscript d sub i, with i being my free index which varies from 1 to the dimension of my space n. So to conclude, I've described the intuition behind the dual vector in tensor algebra. It's a function which takes a regular vector as an input and tells us how much that dual vector changed when we went from one end of the input vector to the other. We also showed how the gradient vector of a function follows the exact same nature, and ultimately we concluded that a dual vector is a covariant vector. In the next video on this playlist, I'm going to go over some algebra involving dual vectors, and more importantly, how we can go from a dual vector to its corresponding regular vector and vice versa. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.